Hello and welcome back to Jenna Gets Creative. It's Monday again and that means I'm doing another book video. If you're only here for art, see you on Wednesday. <laughs> Today I'm going to do another book tag. This is the What Cats Do book tag, originally by Melting Pots and Other Calamities, and I found it on the blog The Reading Addict. This is a 10 question bookish prompt type list based on all the things our feline overlords do. Before I get there, I want to take a few minutes to rave about this golden flame. Yes, I have held this up and talked about it for three videos now. <laughs> if you're not interested in this one just yet, I do have timestamps in the description. You can skip ahead. I'm not quite done with this the day that I am filming, so this is not a review. This will also not be major spoilers, but I want to rave about what I'm loving because I, I literally cannot wait for review time. I, I do think I will be doing a review video on this one. That will probably be next week's video. But yeah, I, I'm loving it. I need to talk about it. I did read the back of the book in a recent video, so I'm not going to do that again. I will just give a summary from somebody who's actually been reading it now. We have Karis. She is basically a slave on this island community ruled by the scriptorium which is a school of people studying all of the runes left behind by civilizations past because they're trying to reanimate all of the automatons Karis, she was an orphan she was a street rat she was plucked off the streets brought to the scriptorium has this rune locked bracelet thing going on that keeps her within the confines of the spaces that the scriptorium wants her to work. Her job is just to crawl around the place, making impressions of all the old runes, so that the script masters can study them without getting their own hands dirty. She's not supposed to actually study the runes, she has been studying the runes in secret because she wants to get out, because her brother didn't work out at the scriptorium and he was sent off somewhere else. She wants to know enough runes to unlock the records office, to find out where her brother was sent, to literally unlock her bracelet, to get off the island to go find her brother. That's what she wants to do. Very early in the book, second chapter, she finds and reanimates an automaton named Alex. Third chapter is his first point of view chapter. This does flip-flop between Karis and Alex, and he was designed by the guy that history paints as the bad guy, the guy who history paints as the person who destroyed automatons. And he decides he's gonna help Karis get off the island because she's probably going to go to the place that he needs to go to find answers for why he was deactivated and why his father is being blamed for everything. All that kind of stuff. They also take along this scriptorium soldier who's a friend of Karis's, his name is Dane. So in this, on this proof copy, there's the synopsis that's clearly going to be in the final printing. There's this information down here about publication dates, the genre it's in, the formats it'll be for sale in at the beginning, the prices that those will be, all that kind of stuff. There's also information about publicity contacts, but between that, there's this bullet point list. I'm not sure if that's going to be part of the synopsis on the official sale copies of the book, or if that's for my benefit as a reviewer who has an uncorrected proof. The middle bullet point, the second bullet point says, features hashtag asexual representation and a celebration of individual differences. So yes, it does. There is a lot of positivity about the LGBTQIA community in this book. There are characters of all sorts of orientations in this book. If I hadn't read that bullet point, I would not have known that there is specifically asexual representation in this book until about two-thirds through. Having read that bullet point before I started reading the book, I assumed it would be Karis because I don't think we're talking sexual orientation when we're talking an automaton, and Dane is clearly interested in Karis. Karis whoosh, doesn't have a clue. <laughs> so knowing that there's ace representation, it's obvious that it's Karis. 
if I had not read that bullet point, I would not have known that Karis is specifically ace. I would have just assumed that she's not interested in Dane until about two thirds of the way through the book. So if you've heard that and you're really excited and you're curious about this book, can confirm there is an ace character, our main character. You're not going to see it shouted from the rooftops. It's very subtle, very tasteful. Also, another reaction I had reading this book, which hopefully will entice you to read, Fairy Polite Pirates. I'm loving this book. The title and the cover design are perfect for the story, but I won't explain them to you now and I won't explain them to you in the review because to do so would spoil the plot. Loving it, so excited about it. This releases on Tuesday, so if you're watching this video the day it goes out, this releases tomorrow, February 2nd, my birthday, and yeah, read this book. This Golden Blade by Emily Victoria being published by Inkyard Press, which is an imprint of HarperCollins, going out February 2nd, 2021. Let's get into the tag. First question is purr. Cats do this when they're happy or relaxed. They do it for other reasons too, but... What books make you happy or relaxed? My answer in the blog post that will be accompanying this video, you can go read it if you want to, Soul Music by Terry Pratchett. Really any of the Discworld novels could go up here or anything else Terry Pratchett has worked on. Good Omens would be another great answer. This is a collaboration between Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman. I specifically chose to answer with Soul Music because although this is the 16th book in Discworld, it's the first Discworld book I read. I was really, really attracted to Discworld because of this book. I have gone back and read several of them. I did go back and read number one next. I have not continued to read them in publication order. There's a lot of debate among the fandom whether or not you are supposed to read them in publication order, or there's other prescribed orders, or people say just read them in whatever order you want. I'm a read it in whatever order you want kind of girl. They can be read separately. They do nod to each other, but if you don't know what you're missing, you don't know what you're missing. So in this one, basically the character of Death needs a vacation. And he goes off into the real world, and if he's going to the real world, then somebody needs to go to Discworld in his place. That ends up being a girl named Susan. And she's just adventuring around Discworld, discovering things, and the people that she ends up wandering around with invent rock and roll in Discworld. And they refer to it as music with rocks in. I just love it. It's it's so endearing. Terry Pratchett definitely makes me happy and makes me relaxed. Question two is sleep. What book puts you to sleep or was just plain boring? So for this one, I joke in the post that I'm very tempted to just throw up some math textbook because although I love math, math textbooks are boring. But my actual answer is one of the textbooks I had to read in my historiography course because if you are studying for an undergraduate degree in history, eventually you're going to take a course in historiography. When I studied it, we had three textbooks. The smallest one was the most painful to read. I don't remember exactly which one it was. I think it was A Global Modern History of Historiography by Eggers, but I'm not 100% sure, so I won't be putting up a cover or anything. Obviously, I didn't keep it. I hated it. Historiography is the study of historians and who wrote history, why did they write it, who did they write it for. It's as close as you're going to get to sociology while still picking a course in the history faculty. It's very, very meta. And this, this one book that we had to read a chapter every week the first chapter was basically a forward because it was written by somebody else. I don't know if this is true of all editions, which again is why I'm not going to commit to that Igor's title and put it up. But this opening chapter had... It, w it was a chapter-length essay on epistemology. Another big word, yes. Epistemology is the study of knowledge and the study of 
learning. <laughs> so, ironically, my mother was doing her master's of education while I was studying for my undergraduate in history, and the semester before, she kept coming across the word epistemology, and we were trying to figure out what it meant, and then the next semester I get this book and the opening chapter is all about epistemology. <laughs> Where was this? A couple of weeks ago. But yeah, I have since read books like the AVR microcontroller and embedded systems using assembly and C. And I think this was worlds more interesting and entertaining than that little book on historiography that opened with a full chapter-length essay on epistemology. Question 3. Seems to play nice until the claws come out. What book has the best plot twists? Normally, when this kind of question comes up, I talk about Quantum Night by Robert K. Sawyer, but at this point you've heard me explain the plot of this book so many times. So I'm gonna come up with a different answer. I'm gonna say Mockingjay, the third book of the Hunger Games trilogy. If you are completely unfamiliar with the Hunger Games, where have you been? <laughs> this came out over a decade ago now. There's a Kirkus Reviews Book of the Year 2009 on the back here. So yeah, where have you been? If you are not familiar with the Hunger Games. Why have I picked this one for the best plot twist? Basically, halfway through this book, everything is flipped on its head. Everything, absolutely everything. Everything Katniss thinks that she is fighting for, everyone she thinks she knows and understands, everything turned on its head. Nope, you're wrong. 180, go in the other direction. Question number four, Cuddles. Which character would you really like to give a hug to? I have also talked about this one before. This is Number of the Stars by Lois Lowry, and this is a historical fiction for middle grade readers about World War II, the Nazi occupation of Denmark. We have a girl named Ellen Rosen. She is Jewish. She's been separated from her family and her best friend, Anne-Marie Johansson, and their family are protecting her, hiding her from the Nazi soldiers and eventually they'll be sending her across the water somewhere to freedom. I'm not entirely sure where or how that works because they'd probably be going north to Norway and Norway got occupied too, so I don't know. But I really just want to give poor little Ellen Rosen such a big hug. Question five, catnip. Which book gave you the warm fuzzies? Most recently, All Bags Go to Cleveland by C.S. Hale. This is seriously one of my new favorite books. This is a fan urban fantasy rom-com. We have our main character, Angela, who is a gremlin, and gremlins, gremlins have magic. They're supposed to use it to make chaos in the world. Most of them choose to do chaos for good. Some of them, like Angela, they don't really like using their magic, and if you are a gremlin and you don't use your magic the way it demands to be used, things start to happen. Small disasters happen all around you. She works as a departures desk agent for an airline that's in the family. I believe it's her grandfather owns it. It's basically all gremlins running it, and all bags go to Cleveland. If something has to happen with her magic, bags get redirected unintentionally, and usually they go to Cleveland to keep her cousin Wendell occupied. <laughs> she ends up redirecting the bag of this frequent flyer businessman who thinks it's fun. <laughs> and he just jokingly tells her that she owes him dinner in exchange for the minor inconvenience. And the whole novel is just her not dating this frequent flyer businessman who likes the chaos that her life brings until she has to confront the fact that she's dating this guy and she needs to tell him who she is. I love it. It's so funny. It's so sweet. It is a romance, but like, I don't like romances in general because I'm not there for the sex scenes. This book hardly has sex scenes. It's 
really about the romance, the relationship, and I love it. I'm here for it. It's great. Question six and question seven are linked, so I'm going to answer them together. Question six is cat breeds. What are your favorite books? Question seven is getting the cat. Describe how you came to know about your favorite books. So I comment in the blog post that you can go read that uh, C.S. Hale's book there, All Bags Go to Cleveland, is one of my new favorites, but I'm not going to repeat. And how can I possibly choose favorite books? Like, there are so many good ones. But I did mention four of my favorites in no particular order. One of them is The Night Circus by Aaron Morgenstern. This really is one of my most favorite standalone adult novels ever. I have talked about this one at length in several videos and several blog posts. I will not drone on about it. When I have time in my audiobook schedule, this one is waiting for me on Libby as an audiobook. I just keep sending it into the deliver later holding pattern. I am finally going to give a review of this book when I get to listen to the audiobook for the first time, which will be like my seventh or eighth read of the book, but first experience on the audio. I will give a review, I will probably film a review. So not rambling about this book any more than I just did. How did I discover this one? I used to work at a grocery store, we had a small books and magazine section, I was helping in that section one day. It caught my eye. It's gorgeous. It seemed really interesting. I bought it. I didn't regret it. One that I don't have a physical copy to hold up right now is it's a Star Trek Next Generation novel called Metamorphosis by Jean or Jean Laura. How did I find it? When I was in high school, I rated all of my mom's Star Trek books. I gave them back, which is why I don't have one to hold up. One of these days, I will get my hands on a copy again. In this one, this is where Data actually gets a chance to be human. Something happens when they're lost on an away mission and he becomes flesh and blood human for a while. And it, it ties into later episodes in the show, it ties into later books with the whole A Measure of a Man thing. I believe that's the name of one of the episodes in the show. Just, is Data a person? Does he have rights? In the books, they do call back to Metamorphosis. In the TV series, obviously, they didn't because it was written first. Data is my favorite. I love Data. The actor, Brent Spiner, is also a February 2nd baby, so we share a birthday. Say happy birthday to him tomorrow, too. One of the things I remember a lot about this book, which is just so random, is the fact that he sees his reflection and he's disappointed that the natural eye color he now has, now that he's flesh and blood and not an android, his eyes are just brown. And he's just like, well, oh, that's so average, so boring. And I've just always thought that was hilarious because I have brown eyes. <laughs> Star Wars Jedi Apprentice, Defenders of the Dead, book five in the Jedi Apprentice series. This is by Jude Watson. This is a series about Obi-Wan Kenobi as Qui-Gon's apprentice as a teenager, and this one is the second of two books where he's on Melita Dan, where there are two warring factions, the Melita and the Dan. He's temporarily left the Jedi Order to help the underground youth who are trying to end this generational war. I adored this series. I have reread it as an adult. This one is my favorite. I devoured this series when it was brand new in like 99. I don't know if other countries had the equivalents, but Scholastic here in Canada, they send out flyers to schools. These flyers go home with the students so that they can pester their parents to order cool stuff out of this flyer. And most of it's books, some of it's toys and science kits and whatnot that I never got. But these were in it and I had just discovered the old Star Wars movies and I was really excited about the new Star Wars movie coming out, episode one, Phantom Menace at the time. <laughs> and I saw these books in that and I wanted them and I got them and I devoured the entire series. I still have the whole series down here. I will make my daughter read them. And the last one I included on the blog post is A Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula K. Le Guin. This is the first in the Earthsea cycle, which I believe is five books long. 
I plan to use the breaks I've intentionally left in my April schedule to reread this series so I can give a really in-depth review of the whole series. This is the original Wizarding School story, if you ask me. I'm gonna save my rambling for when I do that review. I just, I love these so much. Moving on, question eight, Vet Office. What's your least favorite book? Again, hard to pick, but the answer I've gone with for the blog post is Ulysses by James Joyce. Because does anybody like Ulysses, genuinely, who isn't an English professor in university, college? Because this is stream of consciousness, every waking thought of a very average man leading a very boring life, and nothing really happens. And it's a very long book. <laughs> Question nine is being in places they shouldn't. Cliches you don't like. So I'm taking cliches to be the same as tropes, because we talk about tropes a lot in the book community. I really, really, really don't like enemies to lovers. I also really don't like miscommunication tropes. And the final question, question 10, good old cardboard box. What is the most underrated book series? I don't know about the most underrated book series, but a book series I love that I don't hear enough people talking about is The Elemental Masters by Mercedes Lackey. These are, well, elemental magic stories. Every single book has a character who's coming into their elemental magic who typically didn't know anything about elemental magic before they came into it, and then there will be mentors that come into their lives and teach them about it. Some of the mentors are recurring characters, some of them aren't. Many of them borrow from fairy tale plots, which I love. So they're elemental magic stories and they're also fairy tale retelling stories. And if you like that, Mercedes Lackey also wrote the Tales of 500 Kingdoms series, which are also excellent. And those ones are the plots of all of the world's fairy tales have melded together into a thing called the, tradi the tradition. And if you live in one of the 500 kingdoms and you fit the archetype of a character from a fairy tale, the tradition will make sure that you live out that life, and if you stray from it, the tradition will act and will correct your course. <laughs> Usually when people know about Mercedes Lackey, they know about the Voldemar series. They need to know about these other ones. <laughs> Alright, so thank you so much for watching. Uh, next week I will probably do the This Golden Flame review, and like I teased, in April I'm going to be talking about the Earthsea Cycle books. In the meantime, let me know what other bookish videos you want, and if you're also here for art, I have a music-related art project I'm going to do this week, and I will also be doing the second of my three demonstrations with BB Craft. If you're looking for more to watch, I've got some suggestions up here on the left side of the screen. Don't forget to like, comment, maybe even subscribe, and if you like living life creatively, whatever that means to you, I'd love to have you along for the ride. Bye guys!